Thank you, Thomas, uh, for that introduction and also to Building Transformations for giving us um, at AECOM this platform to showcase our unprecedented international design build project. Um, I am a senior project manager with AECOM um, with expertise in the pursuit and execution of large scale alternative delivery P3 transportation projects with uh, experience on um, both the advisory side as the owner's engineer and on the design builder side as the design lead. Um, I've uh, managed many multidisciplinary teams to successfully deliver world-class P3 projects such as the Herb Gray Parkway, Region of Waterloo Light Rail Project, uh, and the Gordie Howe International Bridge. Um, to begin, uh, we'll go to, um, to begin an introduction on the Gordie Howe International Bridge. We'll start there. So the Gordie Howe International Bridge is a new gateway between Canada and the United States. It is the largest infrastructure project on the Canada and US border. There are four components to the project. First is the iconic Cable State Bridge crossing the Detroit River, including access bridges to the ports of entry on both sides of the border. Second is the Canadian Port of Entry that connects to the Right Honourable Herb Gray Parkway in Windsor, Ontario. Third is the Michigan Interchange, which connects to Highway I-75 in Detroit, Michigan. And fourth is the U.S. Port of Entry that connects to the Michigan Interchange. This project is being delivered as a public-private partnership in which the Windsor-Detroit Bridge Authority, known as WDBA, manages the partnership and Bridging North America is the private sector partner to design, build, finance, operate, and maintain the project for a 30-year concession period after construction is complete. As the design lead for the project, over 1,000 AECOM staff across our global network of designers, architects, engineers, specialists, digital leads, field coordinators, and project management professionals have collaborated to bring this symbolic project to life, in addition to 33 direct AECOM subconsultants. Management of the design team is led by AECOM Canada's Alternative Delivery Group, which is based out of the Greater Toronto Area. The Alternative Delivery Group is a team of project managers, technical design managers, digital leads, and support staff that are dedicated to the success of alternative delivery projects. One of AECOM's prime subconsultants on this project is Moriyama and Teshima Architects. We engaged Moriyama and Teshima Architects to bring their expertise with secure border crossing projects to lead the architectural design of the Canadian Port of Entry. We have invited a couple of key staff from Moriyama and Teshima Architects to join us for this event today. Construction of the project is being led by a partnership of Dragados Canada, Fleur and AECON. Construction of the bridge towers, interchange structures, and port of entry facilities are all well underway with an estimated completion date in 2024. Outside of our three Innovation Spotlight Awards, this project has won numerous awards since its inception including several earned by WDBA for its communications and community benefits programs, an Envision Platinum Award for Sustainable Infrastructure, and the project's ISO 14000 Certified Environmental Management System was recognized by the National Association of Envi Environmental Professionals as best available or innovative technology. The port of entry facilities have also been designed to meet a LEED Silver rating. So today, a few of our key design team leads will present our successes in each of the four components of this project, specifically around the topics of overcoming challenges, team collaboration, digital solutions, and taking advantage of best practices to deliver this unprecedented design build project. We'll start with the Michigan interchange. We'll continue on to the US port of entry, the bridge, the Canadian port of entry, and we'll conclude with a discussion on some of the digital solutions that AECOM applied throughout all of our project components. Again, as we go through this presentation, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and we'll endeavor to answer as many of them as we can at the end of today's presentation. Our first speaker is Dipal Vaimawala. Dipal is an AECOM vice president and an engineer of record on the I-75 Michigan interchange. He is experienced in traditional design bid build and design build projects involving major interchanges, highway and railway structures, movable bridges, grade separations, transit facilities, and industrial facilities. 
His expertise spans project management, structural analysis, and design, quality control, constructability reviews, and construction management. The Michigan Interchange consists of the primary connecting ramps to and from the United States Port of Entry and associated local road improvements required to fit the new ramps into the Michigan interstate system. Our work included widening three kilometers of freeway, four new road bridges, five new pedestrian bridges, four long connecting ramp bridges, and a variety of other local road improvements. Thanks for joining us today, DePaul. Let's get started. There were many iterations of design for the five new pedestrian bridge structures crossing I-75 that were developed with both constructability and aesthetics as key areas of focus. Can you describe the challenges that were faced, the options that were developed, and the solutions that were selected for those structures? Sure. <clears throat> thank you, Brian, and thank you, audience, for the opportunity. Uh, as Brian mentioned, there are five pedestrian bridges along the I-75 corridor, which is part of the project. Uh, this project was designed with a key interest of aesthetics and context sensitive solutions in mind. Uh, we presented three different concepts for the pedestrian bridges, as you can see on this slide. One of them was an arch, one of them we called trussle, and then sort of a triangular uh, option. This went through a rigorous public input process. Uh, I participated in a few of them and really enjoyed how all the opinions came together. Finally, the public majority selected the arch bridge, uh, which you will see on the next slide. Uh, and as the slide shows some other aesthetic features as well. So, the, the, so we presented the arch and that was selected and that's what we designed finally. Uh, so uh, go ahead, Brian. I'm sorry, James. Yeah, th thanks to Paul. Um, it's certainly great to showcase um, for those structures that public input was given such a high priority in the final design build process. Sure. To Paul, uh, continuing on the subjects of designing for constructability and aesthetics, the Michigan interchange connecting ramp bridges had to be designed to meet stringent technical requirements and to be compatible with the aesthetics of the main span and the approach bridges. How was this addressed in the in the design of the new Michigan Interchange connecting ramp structures? Sure, James. So I would like to highlight some of the key features that's part of this project. Typical bridges in US are designed for 75 years of life expectancy. That's per the ESTO. Uh, this project required 125 years of life expectancy, which triggered a lot of additional design and long-term durability features that had to be accounted for. In addition to, we had to design the structures for US as well as the Canadian core. So, you know, it, it did have a lot of challenges, but we were happily uh, overcoming that. And, and, and we are very proud that we, we managed those. One of the uh, aesthetic features for the peers was the, the project agreement insisted that we match our peers for the connecting bridges ramps with the main spans and approach. They call that a family of peers. And as you can see, some of the peers in this slide that's the attempt we made and uh, final outcome did come out as it matched the family of peers. So another you know, consideration that was given during the design from the aesthetics point of view. And then one more point I want to bring up is these bridges, uh, the connecting ramp bridges are long span curved geometry bridges. Uh, they were supposed to be jointless uh, and that's what we delivered, which is a very tough to achieve. Uh, these bridges, they breathe, they expand and contract, so we need to provide joints. But we are happy to say that we met the requirement without compromising any PA. So these are some of the feet, some of the challenges uh, that we had to overcome. Yeah, as you described, Paul, um, you know, given the number of bridge structures across the entire project, uh, development of that family appears from the Michigan Interchange through to the approach bridges and onto the main bridge uh, certainly enabled a cohesive visual experience on the on the project. DePaul, with such a large undertaking and where collaboration was a key proponent to our success, was there a specific platform that assisted with the design specific to the Michigan Interchange? Sure. So a couple notes on that. Uh, you know, I become the form believer of ProjectWise. That's the that's the, that's what we use as a platform, uh, which reduced the design environment time almost by 10 to 12 percent. It's a phenomenal way to collaborate and work together. We also went paperless and digital on this uh, on this project and I venture to say that we reduced the carbon footprint by about 5% by not just printing papers and, and have the virtual digital environment. And then one more point I want to I want to make, as we all know, through the pandemic, the design development continued. Uh, but I'm thankful that the project wise platform enabled us to swiftly switch 
to the virtual environment uh, and 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 not have tremendous challenges. But you know, so we are very thankful for the technology and how we use that to our advantage and to project's advantage. Thanks for joining us today, Dupal. Um, we'll expand further on our digital first strategy later on today's call. Now we'll move on to the U.S. port of entry. So the U.S. port of entry consists of 68 hectares of development, eight building structures, and includes U.S. border inspection facilities. Once constructed, the U.S. port of entry will be one of the largest ports of entry in North America. Joining me today to tell us more about the U.S. port of entry are Jonathan Failing and Edward Hunterberg. Jonathan Failing is the design lead for the U.S. Port of Entry. Jonathan is an AECOM architect and project manager with 31 years of experience spanning a range of architectural projects, including commercial, institutional, federal, and transportation projects across all phases of design development, bidding, and construction contract administration. Jonathan provides design and technical leadership, generates contract documents, and performs quality reviews. Edward Hunterberg has a key role in the architectural design team for the U.S. Port of Entry. Ed has over 10 years of architectural experience on retail, commercial, healthcare, government, transportation, industrial, and education projects. His expertise includes technical design, contract documentation, construction administration, as well as BIM and AutoCAD management from project startup through to construction. My first question is for Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, how did we collaborate with our construction partners uh, to expedite construction schedule, improve constructability, and mitigate risk associated with changes initiated during the final design and construction stages of this design build project? Uh, thanks, James. Um, we did have a couple changes uh, with success. The first change came from our build partner. Uh, the request was uh, the request was to look at a relocating approximately 10,000 square feet of sub-level space to a new location. Our design team was able to locate a space on the second floor that worked aesthetically and the layout accommodated, accommodated to the program. And it was also approved by the client. Um, so there's a lot of back and forth between a uh, build partner and the client to get this approved. Uh, the benefits to making this change kind of um, just before construction was starting was to expedite the foundation systems in this area, reduce the amount of excavation, eliminate the uh, sub-level uh, concrete walls, and alleviate any risk concerns. So that was our kind of our first change um, with, our bird, uh, with our build partner. The second change came from our client at the secondary inspection canopy. Our original design provided a, a polycarbonate roof structure for the entire canopy area. The owner requested us to decrease the amount of uh, polycarbonate and enclose the required infrastructure, uh, which consisted of electrical conduits, uh, fire suppression systems, and mechanical piping. And we had to try to enclose that above a metal panel soffit area. The new design is a combination of polycarbonate skylights a standing seam roofing system, and a metal soffit. Our, our, our design team uh, provided a design that met the visual quality requirements. We maximized the skylight openings, providing daylight to the uh, officers that actually work under the canopy while enclosing the required infrastructure above the soffit. So for each of these uh, successful changes, our team utilized uh, the existing uh, Revit models Navis works to uh, look at any clashes, uh, rendering software, and BIM 360, BIM 360 in a, to provide the necessary information back to the build partner and to the owner so we could maintain our construction schedule and timeline. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Ed, my next question is for you. A definite advantage to the design build project delivery model is the opportunity for the designer to engage subcontractors and suppliers in a collaborative manner early in the design process. Can you share an example of how AECOM was able to get from concept design right to collaborating with fabricators to align with the vision of the design and meet expected outcomes? Thank you, James, for the introduction and question. 
Let us start with the overall architectural concept. All buildings on the land port of entry site share a similar architectural expression to unify the facility in an economical but elegant aesthetic. The architecture is centered within the realm of contemporary minimalism, embracing the tenets of simplicity, clean lines, and good proportions. We have selected building materials which are of their time and examples of technological sophistication. The building materials selected for the U.S. port of entry include precast concrete panels, metal composite material panels, and insulated clear vision glazing. The precast panels are one of the primary cladding materials used for this facility. This building material was selected for its low life cycle costs, versatility, thermal performance, durability, sound control, and speed of erection. The approach to color and texture of the concrete has been coordinated between the U.S. and Canadian port of entry. Both ports of entry share a similar aesthetic, but each retains a distinctive and unique response to the surrounding context to which they reside. At the U.S. port of entry, the precast paneling is designed to have a vertically striated surface texture, in turn showcasing and celebrating the material's plasticity. The precast panels offer an opportunity to experience the material at multiple scales. The panel color visually contrasts and creates a clear separation between the complementary building materials that coexist within the composition of the building form, best observed through the vehicular perspective. The vertically striated surface texture of the precast paneling allows for an intimately scaled experience which the building material at a with the building material at a pedestrian relationship to interject the perception of motion into a stationary but multiple material using a form liner the concrete fins became a result of extrapolating form through music using a computer sampling of the digital analog sound wave derived from the national anthem and several patriotic songs the basis of the precast fins were, were established. Fused deposition modeling, FDM, a type of 3D printing involving three main parts, a printing plate, filament coil, and an extruder was used in conjunction with 3D modeling software to develop and manifest physical scaled PLA models of the precast panel fin pattern to assist in validating and assisting the team in visualizing such a unique texture and pattern in addition to witnessing the effects of daylighting and shadows dancing across the surface. Once a prefabrication team was on board the project, Revit, model, Revit models and CAD files were digitally shared. The same files that were once used to make scaled 3D printed models were then used to develop the form liner and shortly thereafter casted the full-size precast panel mockups. The handover of the digital content was seamless with little alteration of the original fin design. Using a cryptographic algorithm to generate random sampling, we arranged the patterns across the building facade. Throughout, design, throughout the design process, from concept to the CNC machine form liner to the casted concrete mock-up, technology and collaboration was utilized in a manner to best adhere to the client's visual quality standards for the design of the facility. Thanks, Ed. That's that's great. It's really interesting to hear how you've extrapolated form through music and collaborated with the prefabrication team very early in the design phase of the project to bring it to life. Thanks, Jonathan and Ed. And now we'll move on to the bridge. This iconic structure, named after Hockey Hall of Famer Gordy Howe, is 2.5 kilometers in length, including approach bridges with a clear main span of 853 meters over the Detroit River. The Gordie Howe Inter International Bridge will have six vehicle lanes and dedicated multi-use paths for pedestrians and cyclists. Joining me now to talk about some of the bridge's unique design features is Dr. Barry Chung. As a complex bridge lead at AECOM, Barry has designed a wide range of structural projects over his 28 year career, including complex bridge projects and civil and structural projects in steel, reinforced concrete and timber. Barry specializes in complex bridge and structural analysis and design, seismic engineering and complex design build projects. Thank you for joining us today, Barry.
That's Barry, the um, bridge has been promoted extensively as the longest cable stayed main span bridge in North America. Can you please share some further details um, of the bridge design and discuss how constructability and global collaboration were integral to developing this record setting main span design? Yeah, thanks, James. Of course, the, the most prominent feature of the bridge is a magnificent clear span across the river. We have the towers on either side of the river. And uh, this feature allows us to have no piers in the water. And the advantage of that is we avoid any construction in the river and the challenges that that brings. Uh, and the other advantage is that uh, once completed, the, uh, there is no ship impact issues because it allows the free movement of ships and barges along the river. So for our superstructure, our superstructure features a composite deck, which is a series of beam elements in a grid with a concrete deck on top. And this structural system allows a much simpler and lighter superstructure detailing and also is much simpler to erect. And then rounding out our superstructure on the underside uh, is our use of non-structural soffit panels, which also helps simplify details of the superstructure, but still provides an elegant closed box aesthetic, as you can see on the slide. Now, for us to complete the design of the bridge, we organized and mobilized a global team of complex bridge experts from around the world uh, and assembled from multiple offices in Canada, United States, and Hong Kong, and also in the UK that we mobilized to be able to complete the design of this iconic structure. Thank you, Barry. It's great to hear how we've collaborated worldwide to bring this incredible project to life. Another feature of the bridge are its towers. Can you describe what inspired the development of the tower design and also speak to the decision to use exposed fittings to con improve constructability? Yeah, so James, the, the towers, even though they are imposing in height, during our design, we did try to minimize and achieve the minimization of the tower height. So that way it didn't intrude or minimize the intrusiveness of the landscape. Uh, one of the features we move down, you'll notice that there is no horizontal strut at the deck level, uh, which may be typical in such a shape of an inverted Y. And this provides much cleaner and more elegant aesthetics, but it also gives you an illusion that the deck is floating between the towers, which I think is a nice feature. Uh, when we look at the tower leg and its slope geometry, uh, we can see that it actually replicates the curvature of a hockey stick taken in a slap shot, which is a great tribute to the namesake of the bridge, Gordie Howe. And then as we go to the bottom of the tower legs, we have a feature of the exposed footings. And we raise those footings above the ground to be able to minimize the excavation and groundwork. Uh, and that um, reduced the amount of uh, earthwork that we needed to do. And this is particularly uh, an advantage on the US side due to the presence of contaminated soils on that side and the need to excavate, treat, and dispose of those soils. The other advantage of having these exposed footings is that it also avoided the need to dewater since the footings are very close proximity to the Detroit River. So there's a couple of the features of the, the tower, James. Thank you, Barry. Um, yeah, just I'll point out in the photo on the left, you can see the tower construction on both sides of the border. Um, it's certainly been uh, quite uh, impressive and amazing to see them rise into the sky. Mm, that it is. For my uh, last question for the bridge, um, both the size and location of the bridge presented environmental challenges and opportunities. Can you describe some of the environmental and sustainability elements that were incorporated into the bridge design? Yes, James, one aspect of the environmental challenges was uh, light pollution. So our, our main bridge and our bridge uh, will be lit with a series of lights lighting up the cables and the tower. Um, so what we did, what we did and have are uh, efficient LED light fixtures. And these light fixtures have precise optical controls, uh, including cut off baffles and louvers. And that helps minimize the spill of light and stray light into the sky and the uh, surrounding animal habitat areas. 
Uh, the, the other aspect that we're able to uh, provide is some lighting controls that allows us to extinguish or dim the lights if there are any atmospheric conditions that may trigger that, and that would reduce the amount of scatter. For example, if there's low cloud, we would be able to extinguish the lights or dim them uh, to reduce that amount of scatter. And also, if, and during the bird migration season, it allows us to control those uh, those lights to avoid any issues with uh, bird migration. And the, the second and last aspect of the environmental is the provision of a, a, a peregrine falcon nest box that we are going to provide on the Canadian side. And it's a falcon box up on one of the piers and it'll have access for any wildlife staff to be able to monitor uh, any of the, the falcons that might be nesting there. And there's also provision for video monitoring of that falcon box too. So this is a small, uh, but I think an important contribution that we're making to the environment. So there's a couple of environmental challenges there, James. Thank you, Barry. Yeah, our core uh, value at AECOM to sustain is certainly evident in the bridge design decisions. So thanks for sharing those. Sure, my pleasure. Um, I guess as a reminder to those listening, if you do have any questions, um, please enter them in the chat box and we'll endeavor to answer as many of them as we can at the end. So we've talked about I-75, the U.S. port of entry and the bridge, and now we come to the Canadian port of entry, which is a 53-hectare site with nine structures in incorporating both inbound and outbound inspection facilities, toll collection booths, and operations and maintenance facilities. Once constructed, uh, this port will be the largest Canadian port along the Canada-U.S. border and one of the largest in North America. We're happy to have Brian Rudy and Sean Robbins joining us from Moriyama and Tashima Architects to share their perspective on the development of the Canadian Port of Entry design. Brian Rudy specializes in the planning and design of major institutional, corporate, and cultural facilities including a broad range of secure facilities such as police centers, corporate headquarters, museums, art galleries, and border crossing facilities. Brian has carved out a specialty with secure Canadian border crossing projects, which has earned him a role as a design advisor and port of entry specialist on several other border upgrade projects, including the Peace Bridge in Prescott in Ontario, Emerson in Manitoba, and the North Portal in Saskatoon. Sean Robbins is a BIM manager focused on Revit integration, best practices, project support, proactive standard development, complex system integration, BIM coordination, content creation, in-house training, troubleshooting, and construction document production. Since 2013, Sean has also inst instructed internationally trained architects and technologists through BIM in professional practice at Ryerson University. Through his commitment to teaching, Sean remains at the forefront of BIM advancements and integration, giving him a wealth of extra knowledge that Sean actively reinvests in his professional teams. Brian and Sean, thank you for joining us today. Let's jump thank right you, in. James. Thanks, James. So Brian, um, early in the pursuit phase of the project, we endeavored to challenge the design assumptions that form the basis of the conceptual design for the Canadian port of entry and develop a more intimate understanding of what makes these port of entry facilities effective. Considering the size and complexity to the operations to be performed at the Canadian port of entry, how did you prioritize function, security, and operations in balance with design? It's a good question, James. Definitely, there's no doubt that these are very large uh, and very um, intimidating facilities, border crossings, especially for visitors arriving. Uh, you know, you can see how many lanes of traffic you're arriving down from the bridge uh, in this image. But uh, really, in terms of priorities, function, security, and operations really has to take first, first fiddle. So. Um, we were lucky to see in the bid stage a couple of improvements that we could make um, given our experience in border crossings that that would really actually have a couple of knock-on effects so you can see here a layout of the plaza that was that was done by the compliance teams 
um, as a kind of basis for the design. Uh, we started with this design and looked at optimizing certain elements. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that actually we made some fairly significant and, and dramatic changes to the layout of the facility, not just um, you know minor tweaks, but we actually literally moved buildings around on the site uh, to uh, improve first and foremost operations for Canadian um, uh, border crossing uh, agency, CBSA and CFIA, the Food Inspections Agency. Um, we found a few actually fairly small tweaks we could make in the central uh, uh, operations facilities, uh, inspection facilities that, that actually led us to a cascading chain of larger decisions and larger, larger changes that, that had an effect on, on dramatic effect on the movement of buildings around the plaza. So you can see we actually shifted a few buildings and created a uh, operations and maintenance center, uh, which is at 11 and 10 there. Uh, that services uh, both Canadian and U.S. ports of entry in terms of maintenance. It also serves energy to uh, the entire Canadian port, so it's it's good to have it strategically close to the center of the plaza, like we have it there. And that was um, that was achieved by moving a main staffing parking lot down to the south of the site, and that again had knock-on effects uh, of moving bridges and deleting bridges and and moving other buildings around. So. The, the RFP stage was quite, uh, I'd say, a bit of a whirlwind uh, for us to kind of uh, get our heads around this, but we, we managed to, uh, uh, obviously, we, we were successful uh, as a team, so I think it, it, uh, it lent to that success as a win. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, great to share how we fully utilize the design build process in that RFP, RFP stage to make such impactful improvements to to the conceptual layout and really the operations of the site. Brian, staying with you for a moment, um, our requirement placed on the design team was to an accomplish was to accomplish an articulate overall vision that achieved both the critical functionality requirements and also created a cohesive aesthetic effect for all users on the project that will stand the test of time. How did you approach the overall design vision for the project? Yeah, th that's a good question too, because it, it's again such a large project, so many different moving pieces. But we made, um, in addition to those functional requirements I just mentioned, there was a really concerted effort by the entire team, uh, including Bridge and U.S. Port of Entry and, and Michigan Interchange, to come up with a collective aesthetic for the plaza and for the whole project. Um, so, uh, you know, we were inspired on the Canadian side, uh, specifically by the fact that our port is actually in a fairly non-urban uh, condition. We are at the outskirts of Windsor, and the because you're entering southwards into the plaza, you're actually looking at a backdrop of trees uh, from the neighboring forest. Uh, the U.S. side is a very different condition. When you're descending from the bridge to the northward, in the northward direction, you actually see the Detroit skyline. So it's a very different uh, entry condition. Uh, but in our case, on the Canadian side, we definitely were inspired by uh, images of nature and, and Carolinian forests, of which you see fragments of in this part of Ontario, uh, and the kind of beautiful fall colors. And of course, a little bit by, you know, the hockey, uh, hockey metaphors and, and uh, images of hockey. So um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see how some of that translated. Uh, we, we came up with... Um, uh, a kind of an overarching uh, concept for, I think, a lot of the plaza buildings, both U.S. and Canadian, which was this rising and falling line. And that was really inspired by the bridge, that really gentle arc of the bridge over the river. Uh, and that you'll see that come up in a number of elements on the plaza, specifically the, uh, the arching main, uh, what we call primary inspection canopy, which is in the center of that image. And then uh, secondarily, the secondary canopy, uh, behind that. So this just this idea of this very gentle arch as a kind of gateway to the nation. Um, and here you can see, you know, the, the, that tree line that we were talking about behind that canopy, it really does set a, a strong backdrop uh, to the plaza entry experience. Um, we took that kind of metaphor in the next slide to, to extend into, um, you know, the facade developments of, of some of the buildings on the plaza and this idea of layering of the landscapes, right? The layering of your view into the landscape actually pasted onto a facade 
creating different layers. Uh, the central layer of that main building there is this actual colored fins, uh, colored sort of uh, solar fins um, of the main building that sort of stretches along the whole campus. Uh, we also looked at um, images of the forest in the next slide. Um, uh, you know, and the, the idea of the, the trees that are close and the trees that are far as you're walking through a forest. So the, the gradation of that scale uh, in the concrete. So maybe not as musical as the US side, but uh, uh, inspired nonetheless by something that was very specific to this site. Um, I think that's, I think I'll leave it there, James, but it, I'll just say that, you know, it's really important that the buildings are quiet and, and that actually encourage uh, more straightforward wayfinding through the plaza uh, and, uh, and don't disrupt the visitor because the visitor's nervous, they're pulling out their passport, passport and they're, they're, you know, concerned about bigger things. So we don't want the buildings to, uh, to uh, crowd that uh, thoughtscape. Um, this is just another example of how we sort of in integrated hockey metaphors into that. Thank you, Brian, for sharing those inspirations and that perspective on the design vision. Sean, uh, over to you now. More than 25 engineering and other technical design disciplines contributed to the design of the Canadian Port of Entry. With a project of such size, complexity and ambition, how were digital solutions and workflows established to succeed with the design of the Canadian Port of Entry? Yeah, well, thanks very much, James. Um, from very early on in the project, a high priority was placed on establishing a geo-reference site model so that all building models, each having their own disciplinary model, uh, could be properly coordinated both amongst themselves, but also with the whole site beyond and the civil teams uh, working on that site. So. Mm -hmm. This setup was taken so seriously, in fact, that even before things had officially kicked off, we were meeting face to face and over shouldering this shared coordinate setup and going through it quite pedantically to make sure everyone was set off on the right trajectory for that. Um, there's over 70 models, at least in, in total for the whole Canadian point of entry on its own, which, uh, as I mentioned, they're broken down into the ASM and E disciplines with some even also further broken down into other subspecialties like signage, for example. Um, and this division allowed a very strategic coordination both on the macro and the micro level between the various model authors and all in relation to that site itself, which uh, was, fac was facilitated both through Revit, but also through using aspects of BIM 360. Um, and the complexity of the project itself also set the tone for the rigor to which teams modeled in the BIM environment. So. You know, for me, this is one of the truly impressive aspects of this project, um, the way that teams kind of uh, took this by the horns and was modeled to a very high resolution to create a digital version of each uh, building as accurately as possible, uh, which was then used to you know, predict interferences and issues that might arise during construction. And you know, it's worth stressing that doesn't mean that we created overly detailed models, but we were, we were rather much more strategic in terms of where development was necessary in order to resolve coordination of those models as, as they were progressing um, you know, it, at different times. So the team used, as was mentioned, both Navisworks and the BIM 360 model coordination module, uh, which is nice because it keeps track and a close eye on clashes even as things are developing. Uh, and it allowed us to target clashes more closely during coordination meetings. Often they resolved entirely around this process uh, in, the, in the BIM environment and been through 60 environment. Um, and as, as some of you know, like in the, in the BIM process, sometimes there's a lot of duplication amongst disciplines, uh, but this project was markedly rigorous in that sense where uh, models dovetailed very closely together with one another with very little redundancy, um, you know, in terms of proxy model elements, which constituted a very near identical uh, virtual representation of these models uh, to be constructed. And last point here is that the federated model setup also facilitated a different kind of uh, coordination related to the site's design and operations. So the ability for us to virtually inhabit this site allowed us to test things like uh, site lines and operation flow and things of this nature, wayfinding. Um, so it was very critical to have all of these pieces all in the same campus and be able to operate them through the BIM environment. So thanks very much, James. Thank you, Sean. 
Um, those model development strategies that you described certainly allowed us quite a bit more flexibility in implementing um, significant design changes even later in the project and, and into the construction phase as well. So appreciate that perspective. All right, now, now we're going to talk with Matthew Anderley about the broad digital solutions that were applied across each of the four project components. Matt Anderley is the Director of Digital Strategy for the Digital Practice and Technology Group at AECOM. He is a BIM and technology evangelist with over 22 years of experience in establishing global digital delivery workflows and standards around BIM assets, computational design, automation, interoperability, and analytics. With his wealth of experience on large infrastructure projects spanning healthcare facilities, stadiums, aviation, government, tech and logistics, and science sectors, he's known for guiding large global teams on in the implementation and execution of both collaborative and innovative digital workflows. Matt, thanks for joining us today. Segwaying from our last discussion with the Canadian Port of Entry design team on digital solutions, this project brought a successful 100% digital first solution to a team of over 1,000 designers. Um, that allowed them to collaborate and effectively coordinate the design. How was that accomplished? Well, James, thank you for that great introduction and what a wonderful scenario to have, right? Connecting over 1,000 designers to collaborate on this unprecedented project in North America and achieve this, our product team uh, explored several different agnostic common data environments capable of handling the complexities of our digital workflows, uh, focused on design and like Sean mentioned, geospatial data, which was critical to ensure coordination and alignment between all of our project components. After a series of discovery workshops, the decision to introduce Autodesk BIM 360 and ProjectWise uh, was, or Bentley's ProjectWise was paired uh, as a collaboration platform, which ensured real-time access to critical component data for all facets of our project. Now with the strategy, of course, it's important that we track and validate design data, uh, synchronization and throughput. And as a result, we developed scripted automation to verify data consistency across these platforms. Yeah, as you mentioned, our, our team embraced a digital first strategy, which um, uh, which certainly helped us um, with the design of uh, this project. Um, today, we are witnessing a standard to use computational design practices uh, in streamlining time-consuming tasks and to deal with complex geometry. Can you share an example of where scripts were incorporated on this project to effectively reduce costs and design time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, what we're looking for is, uh, you know, and today we're looking to, to develop uh, computational design practice assistant streamlining, uh, like you said, and certainly our team uh, was was challenged with this in, in such a complex project. So what we did is we developed uh, several dynamo graphs uh, to strategically introduce these computational methods addressing key design challenges for this project. And one of the most notable was during the design development phase where the curvature of the canopies, both horizontal and vertical, were twisting and changing shape significantly along with varying slope degrees and, and updates to those changes uh, between the clearances of, of both the expansion booths and the toll booths. So each time these adjustments were made, our structural team had to run analysis on the complex structural system supporting these large canopies, which is no small effort. And by developing a dynamo graph to evaluate the surfaces of the changing design and to drive a new structural framing solution, incorporating calculations that govern the trust framing elements, we were able to efficiently adjust the structural uh, solution to match the design of the new architectural canopies. Now, what would have been a very labor intensive change for our structural team, uh, we were able to automate providing a computational design solution that was adaptive to the design and minimized coordination complications. Uh, this provided immense clarity to the structural design and saved us potential 60% uh, of overrun costs. Yeah, that's really impressive, Matt. Um... For my last question, I'm curious about tracking changes and ensuring the latest design iterations are always reflected in our project delivery systems. With thousands of electronic files being exchanged between the design team and our construction partners, how is this managed? 
When planning the digital delivery strategy uh, for the project, we began by establishing a strong data-centric hierarchy for identification and organization. Uh, this provided the framework for tracking and validation of design files and project deliverables uh, throughout the process. One of the key contributors to our success in managing our digital delivery for Gordie Howe International Bridge was our ACOM developed model performance analytics platform. MPA is an autonomous metrics capture and reporting solution that provides unprecedented optics into our project progress and model health and uh, tracking our digital delivery compliance all presented through a series of interactive dashboards. Now, as we are approaching the end of the design phase and construction has already begun, ACOM has invoked a workflow that provides the contractor full access to our digital design files, a process which we introduced at the 60% completion milestone, which allows them to forecast schedules, budgets, uh, and prepare sub-trades for upcoming installation. We're also utilizing an open BIM concept, which was incorporated through the Autodesk BIM 360 common data environment. This allows our teams to share, review, and comment bi-directionally in real time, referencing all project components. The primary functionality we are leveraging to accomplish this is the issues and the model coordination modules uh, and expanding on that, taking design data into to a real-time review. This process will continue throughout the construction phase to establish as-built models and finalize as-record models, uh, which we're going to be developing for handover. So the workflow has begun uh, to establish by having these designers, contractors, and trades all work collaboratively through a federated model hosted in BIM 360, which provides that single source of truth for all of our stakeholders. So while design files are the, the true source of, of our design intent and will be used to determine a best approach for installation, fabrication models will still be introduced to finalize and evaluate uh, virtual construction outcomes. Now throughout the duration, BIM 360 issue tracking integrated with the Navisworks uh, implementation will be the line of our communication for ongoing discoveries and the tracking mechanism for solutions on any of these issues that are found. Now with federated models acting as our as-built conditions, ACOM will be able to transfer the design intent model to an as-built model ready to incorporate the data required for our RECA model handover. Thank you, Matt. Um, certainly our model uh, performance analytics platform uh, supported uh, management of our digital delivery on this project. So thank you for setting that up. Okay, um, now I'm just going to check the time. So we got about seven minutes uh, remaining in today's um, presentation allotment. So um, we'll open the floor to any questions. Again, please enter any questions that you may have in the chat, and we'll we'll uh, try to get through as many of them as we can. So I'm just looking at the chat now, and I'm I'm seeing a first question from Tyler Burr. Um, the question is for for Sean Robbins. Um, uh, Tyler asks, uh, what environment and software did you, uh, did your civil department model in? Also, did you develop an asset information management plan for data deliverable to the owner? And um, Matt uh, Anderle may want to comment on that as well. So, Sean, do you have uh, some perspective there? Yeah, that's that's a great question. It's, it's so good that I might defer it to Matt um, because I spent a, a bit more time in the trenches uh, with respect to coordination and that side of things. Uh, and I think Matt dealt more with the, the management side of things uh, from ACOM's perspective. So Matt, I, I don't know if you have anything to add uh, or you wanna take that one on. Yeah, absolutely. Our uh, civil department used Civil 3D and we're integrating smart intelligent objects in Civil 3D that we used in a consumable way then that we could share among all of our designers. So uh, through that asset management and, and uh, custom data integration was was processed through that platform, which is the, the primary authoring tool. Thank you, Matt. Um, and, and Sean as well, of course. Um, so Simon asks, uh, was this an open BIM uh, adoption? And, and Matt, do you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, absolutely it was. Uh, so the, the importance of this P3 project was to make sure that all the key stakeholders had the information they needed in real time. And so we really tried to make sure that all this, all the aspects of the project and all facets of our design uh, were available to all the team members and really the, the collaboration strategy we used and uh, the information that we used in, in sharing communication through like the issue system and, and the, the dialogue that happens through comments within those platforms enabled us to really have that open discussion, that open conversation uh, throughout the project. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Matt. Um, Tim Moore asks uh, for Matt, what program was used for the uh, computational design of those canvas? So we, we leveraged Autodesk's platform with Forge and Dynamo, uh, taking into account um, strategic uh, 
protocols in place and, and use those as the framework for what the computational results yielded us. And with Dynamo is, is the, the main kind of scripting automation program, then of course, using the, the automation platform or the computational aspects of cloud to be able to, to generate those results for us. Um, a, a pairing of those and, and using the, the cloud computational abilities, obviously with uh, the expansive nature of what we can do through like AWS and other other hosting platforms that Forge uses, uh, provides us that kind of real time almost uh, integration of of these results. Like I mentioned in the canopies, you know, to assess the structural conditions uh, as the canopy shape changes, um, computation was used to, of course, you know, make those design changes to the structural system. Thanks, Matt. Um... I see uh, Vince uh, is asking um, for further information about AECOM's model analytics platform. Can you uh, speak to that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. That? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is something that we've developed um, in-house, and uh, and it it works in the, the Forge environment uh, to assess models. It does a dissection of those files, uh, really extracts the metrics and and key. Uh, pieces of information that, that indicate thresholds for us to be able to assess both progress, uh, project progress and our, our health and compliance of those models. Um, and through an automated um, introduction within uh, the, the Forge backend, uh, it's, it's, running, it's running in an autonomous state throughout the project. So milestones as we deliver uh, certain key uh, updates within the project, it assesses those key changes and uh, and automatically triggers the extractions to give us updated uh, reports. So it runs in the background of our, our system through Forge. It uh, reveals that information back to us through dashboards and Power BI. And, uh, and the teams have that information then now at the forefront of the project to be able to visualize uh, some of the key uh, indicators within models that might suggest that, uh, that health or other compliance issues might be of, of concern. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, Aske is asking uh, for some further uh, uh, discussion on the, the bridge structural design. I see Joshua is asking a, a similar question uh, next uh, to elaborate on the bridge deck design and, and how you lighten the spans. Um, so Barry, maybe you could uh, maybe you could speak to that a bit a bit more if there's anything you'd like to add further to your uh, to your discussion on the structural design earlier in today's presentation. Yeah, I can speak to that. Although it's a it's a fairly broad question on the whole structural design, but I think <laughs> part, <laughs> in the time we have, but probably what I'll say is that uh, you know the, the process of the design is probably not too dissimilar from a, a, a traditional uh, type bridge. You know, we have a global model that we input loads. It's just it's a bit more complex of a model. Um, so we you know we, we have a global model. We input loads, output. They'll put the demands from there, and then we go into uh, kind of component designs of each of the individual portions. It's just uh, on, on this particular bridge, we also go through a process of uh, the erection condition where we, we actually simulate the build out of the bridge, which is a, uh, a much bigger task in this case um, for the uh, erection condition. Um, as far as lightening up the the structure and the deck design, I mean the, the deck has basically a concrete uh, deck element in there, and the, the lightening really is a function of utilizing a kind of more traditional I beam type sections um, to help avoid any of the kind of the like, like a box for example, an orthotropic deck, kind of the box condition where it's a little bit of a heavier structure where we just have discrete beams and floor beams in that in that aspect. So probably just in the time, that's probably just a couple of highlights of, of that, James. Uh, yeah, thank you, Barry. Um, yeah, well, I see we're, we're up against the clock here. So I'm going to, I'm going to cut off the questions there. And again, um, you know, please, please feel free to contact any of us uh, for any further questions that you may have or like to know anything further. Uh, I'd like to, um, I close from AECOM's perspective, and then I'll pass it over to Thomas to give some perspective as well on, on closing remarks. But um, just I, I wanted to mention, um, you know, so uh, AECOM is one of the world's most trusted infrastructure consulting firms with experience on hundreds of P3 and alternative delivery projects around the world. Um, our experience, both as the owner's advisors and the design build contractors, gives us a unique perspective of working on all sides of a project 
and knowing how to deliver major infrastructure both on time and within budget. When it comes to innovation, Digital AECOM combines our leading industry knowledge with digital consulting services and products to define, develop, and implement personalized and even disruptive solutions that accelerate our clients' digital journey. We have developed tools, systems, and processes backed by a team of over 2,000 digital practitioners who work across the program and project lifecycle to enhance project delivery, achieve better outcomes, and support our clients in their own digital transformation. So again, please visit digital.aecom.com to learn more. Thank you.